Hello, everyone. Welcome to one of our Wednesday with Woodward sessions. We're so excited you're back with us, and uh, we are going to talk ESG today. My name is Joan Woodward, and I have the privilege of running the Travelers Institute, which is the public policy and educational arm of Travelers Insurance. Today, we're going to explore these issues that really impact our professional and our personal lives in these really uncertain times. So first, I want to um, uh, let you know that you're welcome to join our mailing list by emailing institute at travelers.com. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn, watch a webinar replay at travelersinstitute.org. Uh, and if you look in the chat feature right now, we're gonna add a registration link for all of those upcoming programs we're gonna have this summer. So before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's webinar. We have a very special program for you, and always, we'll save time at the end for your questions. Uh, so just put those in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, send anonymously if you don't want me to read your name. So we're thrilled to be joined with our, with our partners today for this webinar, including the Partnership for New York City, the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, Metro Hartford Alliance, and the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. A huge thanks to all these partners for the work that they do and for helping us to put on today's program. Today, we're excited to explore how environmental, social, and governance issues, otherwise known as ESG, impact a company's long-term success. Increasingly, ESG has become a very popular buzzword out there, discussed in investor circles, employee recruitment and retention, and a lot more areas. But what does it really mean? And so, so many different groups seem to care about it. And especially, this is getting louder and louder in corporate America and among employees. So we have two fantastic speakers today uh, who are going to outline what are ESG issues, first of all, and why they impact a company's ability to create that long-term value that we all want. They'll also help us understand anticipated regulatory and disclosure requirements and what they can mean for public companies and for all of us going forward. So I'm truly honored to be joined today by my neighbor, just down the street, Paul Atkins, former commissioner of the US Securities and Exchange Commission, and currently chief executive Potomac Global Partners. Commissioner Atkins founded Potomac Global Partners, a financial services consultancy in 2009. He advises financial services companies on a number of regulatory and compliance issues including Dodd-Frank compliance and US and European regulation and corporate governance issues. Prior to founding Potomac Global Partners, he served two terms as SEC commissioner from 2002, 2008. And thank you for your public service, Paul. For those not as familiar, the role of the SEC is to serve as the investor's advocate to promote fairness in the securities markets and to share information about companies and investment professionals to help investors make informed decisions. During Commissioner Adkins' tenure, he advocated for increased transparency and consistency in the SEC's decision-making and enforcement activities for smarter regulation that uh, considers cost and benefits to society. So drawing on that experience, he'll place anticipated ESG disclosure requirements in the context for us and help us make sense of what the current regulatory environment is. And next joining me is my friend and colleague, Yafi Cohen, uh, Vice President and our Chief Sustainability Officer here at Travelers, and she's also Group General Counsel. Yafi joined Travelers in 2017 and has led our ESG engagement and communication strategies, including developing a comprehensive sustainability website and integrated sustainability report. She also chairs our firm-wide sustainability and ESG committee. In this role, she meets regularly with our stakeholders to convey travelers' approach to ESG and understand what issues are most important to our investors. She serves as chair of the Society of Corporate Governance newly formed Sustainability Practices Committee. She was named to risk an insurance list of 2020 insurance executives to watch and was a finalist for Government Governance Professional of the Year by Corporate Secretary. Prior to joining Travelers, Yafi was a member of Simpson Thatcher's Public Company Advisory Practice, advising public companies on issues related to securities laws, corporate governance, including the SEC reporting and disclosure requirements, shareholder proposals, and responses to formal and informal SEC inquiries. So she knows her way around the SEC. 
I look forward to hearing uh, what the, this thoughtful discussion will produce. And with that, I'm going to turn it right over to my friend, Yafit. Thanks, Joan. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, Joan, you're absolutely right. There's so much talk about ESG these days, but it's really difficult to have an informed discussion about ESG without first reaching a mutual understanding as to what that term means. And I don't think there's a universal definition of ESG that's used by all corporations, investors, and other market participants around the globe. But my view and Traveler's view, uh, which is based on dozens of conversations we've had with investors over the years, is that ESG at its core refers to the risks and opportunities that could impact a company's ability to create value over the long term and how the company manages those risks and takes advantage of those opportunities to ensure its long-term economic sustainability. So ESG is a term that recognizes that a company's value creation does not depend only on its financial or business strategy, but that the way it handles various environmental, social, and governance matters could also impact its value, either positively or negatively. So that's all in the abstract. Um, and so I'll give you a few examples that will really make it come to life. Think about, for example, ethical violations that have come to light at a well-known bank or at a large foreign auto manufacturer. Think about the data breaches that we read about seemingly weekly in the press. Think about environmental concerns like a, a large oil spill. Um, those are all examples of things that have had significant negative impacts on companies' reputations and their value, potentially, uh, and in some instances have generated litigation. So all of that is to say that as we have heard repeatedly from our investors, while at times there could be overlap, ESG is fundamentally about value, not values. So with that understanding of ESG in mind, it's really not hard to see why ESG matters. First and foremost, addressing the company's relevant ESG issues is important for staying competitive in the market. It's absolutely critical for companies to take a holistic view of risk and remain forward thinking in terms of opportunities and innovation. And another way to look at it is that financial success and creating shareholder value are inextricably linked with taking care of all of the company's stakeholders. Now for those companies that like travelers are publicly traded, there's another good reason to pay attention to ESG. Investors, as Joan has mentioned, are increasingly expressing interest in ESG information, recognizing that how companies handle relevant ESG risks and opportunities can be important to understanding the long-term value potential of a company. Investors are also facing asset management industry pressures to fold ESG factors into their analyses. So for example, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment or PRI encourages investor signatories to commit to, quote, incorporate ESG into investment analysis and decision-making processes. And the PRI now boasts well over 3,000 signatories with over $103 trillion in assets under management. In addition to that, with Europe being more progressive on ESG, global clients expect institutional investors to include ESG factors into their investment thesis. And finally, with the growth of passive investing, which now accounts for approximately half of US assets under management, and the simultaneous outflows of capital experienced by active US equity funds, what we're seeing is that active investors have begun using ESG as a selling point, And at the same time, passive investors have begun uh, actively engaging with companies on environmental and social issues as a way to affect change. The bottom line of all of this is that to compete for global institutional assets, asset managers, regardless of their size, regardless of their investment strategy, are increasingly committing to incorporate ESG in some fashion into their investment processes. 
Now, increased investor interest in ESG means increased investor interest in ESG information from public companies. Issuers that don't give sufficient attention to business relevant environmental and social issues, or frankly, those that don't provide sufficient public disclosure on how they're addressing those issues, put themselves at a disadvantage and they run the risk that their investors will make incorrect assumptions about the company. Along similar lines, the third party data providers and ESG rating firms that investors often consider to some degree in their investment analysis may hold it against public companies if they're perceived to give insufficient attention to ESG issues. And those companies may also be more vulnerable to environmental and social political and political proposals, um, shareholder proposals, which have become more prevalent uh, in recent years. Now, it also bears mention that having and articulating a thoughtful approach to business relevant environmental and social issues creates great opportunity for all companies, whether or not they are publicly traded, to enhance their brand, engage their employees, and attract potential employees. Recent studies are suggesting that consumers today are more likely to trust and be loyal to companies that support environmental or social issues, and that employees want to work for companies that have a greater purpose. And these trends seem to be even more pronounced among the younger generations. So at Travelers, when we embarked upon our sustainability reporting journey, our primary objective was to articulate for our investors how we create sustained value in the broadest sense, But we also understood that being more public about how we're taking care of our customers, our communities, and our employees would engender more positive feelings about our brand, would cause employees to be even more proud of travelers, and would give recruits even more reasons to want to join our company. Now, while I strongly believe that ESG, as I've defined it, is of critical importance, I'd like to share a word of caution with you. Beyond mainstream institutional investors that view specific ESG issues as risks that could impact their investments, and beyond customers and employees who appreciate companies who are doing well by doing good, there are countless groups putting significant pressure on companies regarding a broad array of environmental, social, and political issues. Those groups are increasingly calling upon corporations to solve complex societal issues that have historically been within the purview of a democratically elected government. Those frustrated with the government's inability to affect societal change are attempting to achieve their desired goals by shaming companies to take action unrelated and even detrimental to their ability to create shareholder value. And many of these groups have latched onto the popular term ESG in an effort to influence corporations to achieve their own agendas. The conflation of ESG with agenda-driven priorities divorced from shareholder value blurs the line between value and values. And this dynamic has given rise to a monumental challenge for companies, which if not handled properly, properly, could result in several dangerous consequences. First, when corporations are pressured to spend management time and resources on items unrelated to shareholder value, shareholder value and by extension the economy will suffer over the long term. Relatedly, the shaming and the ranking of public companies on the basis of issues, again, unrelated to shareholder value has the potential to threaten capitalism over the long term. And in addition, when the corporate venue is used as a substitute for legislative action, democracy could be threatened over the long term as well, as a very small group of like-minded individuals would be impacting social change on a mass level without the benefit of debate or checks and balances. I know this sounds extreme, but it's critical to consider the impact on our democratic structure if the corporation is successfully utilized as a means to engineer societal change on a mass level. 
For these reasons, not to mention corporations' fiduciary duties to shareholders, I think it's incumbent upon corporations to ensure that they do not wade into the cultural wars raging in our society today or weigh in on polarizing issues that could alienate some of the company's customers and employees. At Travelers, we're laser focused on the fact that we are stewards of shareholder capital. The money is not ours to spend based on our own individual morality or values. Following from that bedrock principle is that corporate decision making should be grounded in whether the decision will increase shareholder value over time, recognizing, as I mentioned earlier, that creating long-term shareholder value requires us to take care of our customers, communities, and employees. So at Travelers, when considering actions or initiatives that some might label as ESG, we carefully assess what is in the best interest of the company and its shareholders over the long term. We prioritize the company's key ESG risks and opportunities, and we focus on what we call shared value. Those are efforts that are good for the company and its long-term shareholders, and also good for other stakeholders like employees, communities, the environment. Coming full, back full circle to where I started, it is important to have a clear view of what ESG means for your company. For travelers, ESG or sustainability requires that we do three things successfully. Continue to execute on our long-term financial strategy, continue to innovate to make sure our competitive advantages remain relevant and differentiating into the future, and continue to make good on our commitment to take care of our customers, our communities, and each other, or as we call it, fulfill the traveler's promise. In an increasingly polarized environment, we think that's a winning approach. And now I'll hand it over to Paul for his thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Yafit, and thanks to Joan for inviting me to participate today. And thank you also for everyone online uh, for attending. Um, as both Joan and Yafit uh, noted, ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues have really become the buzzwords of the moment, particularly down here in Washington, D.C., where I am. Um, so I want to spend a few minutes, especially after Yafit did such a great job of uh, surveying, surveying the landscape and how various investor groups and, and other political groups are, are approaching this. I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, surveying how the government is responding to ESG issues and then some of the problems that that entails. So in the Biden administration, just about every cabinet level department and agency and those who are not um, uh, you know, in the cabinet, are looking for ways to insert public policy mandates on climate change and issues around diversity and human resources, among others. There are even discussions around mandates for disclosure for any company, public or private, that provides goods or services under federal contracts. So the Securities and Exchange Commission, where I used to be for uh, uh, many years, uh, about uh, 10 years in total of my uh, career, uh, has been active as well. So there's a new chairman, uh, Gary Gensler, and he's announced his intent to have the SEC staff develop new disclosure requirements for climate change and human capital. Uh, a, a commissioner, there are five commissioners at the SEC, another commissioner, Allison Lee, has said that the SEC should regard ESG disclosures, disclosures as material and therefore required if investors want the information, even if the disclosures may not be relevant to the issuer's financial performance. On the other side, uh, two other commissioners, Hester Peirce and Alad Roisman, have been highly skeptical of these sorts of mandates. Their concerns include the risk that many ESG factors are intended to help special interests instead of investors. They also cite risks in mandating disclosure when there is no consensus on which ESG factors impact financial performance. So compounding this is the confusion and political gamesmanship around the concept of materiality. The European Union and some so-called independent standard setters have embraced concepts such as uh, dual materiality, they call it, or so-called nested materiality, both of which require companies to disclose their effect on society, whatever that may be, um, and to look into their crystal balls and predict what issues may become material. 
the future. In the U.S., supporters of uh, ESG standards claim that ESG issues are material to investors and their decision making, arguing that materiality is determined by what investors want. It's important, however, to remember that the Supreme Court's materiality test does not ask what an investor wants, but rather what information a, a reasonable investor needs. More than 45 years ago, Justice Thurgood Marshall, writing in his 1976 opinion uh, called TSC Industries versus Northway, defined materiality under the U.S. securities laws. So writing for a unanimous court, he said, quote, some information is of such dubious significance that insistence on its disclosure may accomplish more harm than good. If the standard of materiality is unnecessarily low, management's fear of exposing itself to substantial liability may cause it simply to bury the shareholders in an avalanche of trivial information, a result that is hardly conducive to informed decision-making." In this case, as well as a, a follow-on case uh, about a decade later, Basic versus Levinson, the Supreme Court ruled that a fact is material if the omission or misstatement of that fact would alter the total mix of information that a reasonable investor considers when making investment decisions. That means to buy, sell, or hold a stock. So what makes for a reasonable investor? Investors are not monolithic. While most investors are individuals using the capital markets to invest for, the long, for their long-term retirement, education, you know, potential sickness, a rainy day, or others, other things, some investors are motivated by goals other than positive investment returns. For example, certain social impact investors explicitly denounce a profit motive and instead invest in companies seeking to change a business model or alter corporate practices. Needless to say, these latter ones are the exception. Uh, they have uh, money to spend that way. And of course, there are the institutional investors, such as BlackRock and State Street, that today have an outsized voice in calling for ESG disclosures. Many commentators have noted over the years that meeting the request of all investors would result in information overload. When the volume of facts disclosed prevents an investor from understanding what is and is not important. And I have to say that many of my clients in the asset management industry com complain about that constantly. And these are large institutions that are, are well equipped to handle various disclosures. A recent study released by the European Corporate Governance Institute examined re retail shareholder participation in the proxy process, but it also provides some insights into what investors may be looking for or thinking about when it comes to material information. For example, researchers found that retail shareholders, when they choose to vote, tend not to support ESG proposals to the same degree as institutional investors. Similarly, the data show that retail shareholders tend to be motivated to cast a proxy vote when the company's performance or return on investment is poor. A great example of this played out last month at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, where shareholders rebuffed proposals supported by BlackRock requiring all Berkshire Hathaway companies to disclose climate risk and diverse workforce data. As Warren, as Warren Buffett bluntly noted, quote, overwhelmingly the people that bought Berkshire with their own money voted against those propositions. Most of the votes for it came from people who've never put a dime of their own money into Berkshire, end quote. Buffett has similarly noted that retail investors tend to either support management or sell their shares if they do not. Their prime focus is performance including being good corporate citizens and return on investment. So seeing this problem, the Supreme Court has understood the hypothetical reasonable investor to be the standard by which materiality is determined. Importantly, the reasonable investor does not mean a significantly large group of investors or even the majority of investors. Instead, the reasonable investor is determined case by case and is dependent on the facts and circumstances of the situation in question. This goes to another point that mandated ESG disclosures overlook. 
the people in the best position to assess what is material to a given company or industry are not bureaucrats in Washington or so-called independent standard setting bodies. Rather, it's a company's board and management who are the only individuals that possess the complete set of facts and circumstances to make materiality assessments, and they bear a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to do so. While the SEC can question those determinations, it's important to remember that examiners and regulatory and enforcement bodies have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. And additionally, in the United States, unlike Europe or other jurisdictions, shareholders can file class action lawsuits if they feel a material fact is omitted or misstated. Now, it may be that there are companies where disclosures related to the climate change risk or water risk or the threat of terrorism or pandemics, for that matter, will be necessary for the reasonable investor to know. Under the current materiality standard set out by the Supreme Court and ensconced in our securities laws and to date uh, so, uh, enforced by the SEC through its own rules and enforcement cases, companies should disclose that information if it's pertinent and material. So looking ahead, it unfortunately appears that the SEC will barrel ahead with ESG disclosure based on politically convenient understandings of materiality. Ignoring the limiting principle of the reasonable investor, the SEC is set to exercise its own judgment about what investors need to know. One is left to ask, is the pending avalanche of ESG information truly fulfilling the SEC's mission to protect and Investors. I'm sure that the ensuing litigation and other controversies over the succeeding years from whatever they may or may not adopt um, will give us some answers to that. So thank you very much, Sharon. And I turn it back over to Joan. All right, terrific. Well, Paul, your feet. I mean, there's such a lot to unpack with what you said and, and how you're thinking about um, this ESG journey for companies, for the governments. Uh, there's a lot of people, investors, uh, et cetera, very, very interested to see where this is headed. Um, and I really appreciate the way you kind of laid it out. A lot of people on, on our attendance here, uh, we're not experts in this, in this subject and it's very complicated. So uh, Paul, I'm gonna start with you. And again, don't forget to put your questions in that Q&A feature at the bottom there, use the Q&A feature, please. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. So there's so many different groups, as you know, Paul out there, the whole industry, right, has, has sprung up around ESG issues. So um, we'll get to the rating agencies because there's a lot of them out there and we have a couple of questions coming in about which one should they watch uh, for you know, an individual investor. But first, let's start at the beginning. So for companies just starting out on their ESG journey, uh, where do they begin? What advice would you give them? So if you're a business, you're running a business as a CEO of a midsize or even a larger company and you have to consider ESG factors, um, because all of these factors, as you know, are, are critically important to, to society, right, and to governments. But as a, a company starting their journey, what advice would you give them? Many companies, most, I'd say, uh, I bet uh, reporting companies to the SEC um, have already been doing some sort of disclosure because as you laid out and, and I uh, you know, try to show here through the the structure of legal structure and court cases and all that, uh, you know, you have to disclose what's material. And so depending on the company, and the SEC has made this clear going back, you know, 10 years ago or so, 11 years ago, did a uh, special interpretative release on climate uh, issues and disclosure and saying, you know, the materiality framework that uh, the SEC has and the reporting framework you know, kind of help guide uh, people through that. So, um, so if, if it's a new company just really starting out, I think, uh, you know, one is to take an assessment of what are the risks that um, are cha uh, challenging the company and what do your investors, uh, what do you think they need to know about your company and how it's being managed? And back when I was a commissioner back in 2003, I believe, we um, uh, set out a new rule uh, regarding uh, uh, this uh, area of the, uh, 10K, the annual report that companies file called Management's Discussion Analysis, um, asking companies to set forth their risk factors, um, it's item 1A, you know, if you look at your 10K, um, for how they look at their company and what do they think investors should know. Now, that the whole concept was to have 
management directly to investors and you know we were hoping that legal jargon wouldn't get in there and and whatnot but of course um you know over the years uh the lawyers uh get to work and so item 1a now is pages and pages long almost 17 percent of uh you know the annual reports according to some study the average annual report so you know there's a lot to unpack in those but in almost all that i've seen they discuss some kind of uh you know, climate issues and, and other things that might affect uh, their operations or, or may sometime in the future protect, uh, affect their operations because a lot of this stuff, of course, companies are trying to cover things just in case something happens because there are a lot of uh, lawyers and other people out there who want to sue um, uh, them over, um, you know, what they could claim it would not be, um, uh, you know, proper disclosure of what might happen. So I, I would say, you know, that's the first step is to make a real assessment of what's uh, affecting the company and how you're managing it and how uh, then what do you think investors should know. Uh, look to SEC interpretative uh, releases and the guidance that's out there. And then also, you know, there are multiple frameworks and all sorts of you know, advisory firms and things uh, like that out there. Um, but, uh, you know, that's also very confusing. But I think if you kind of keep things simple, focus on, uh, you know, what's, what you think is important to impart to your investors, uh, that's the first place to start. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Paul. We'll get back to those rating agencies in a, in a few minutes here. But um, Travelers has been doing ESG, doing ESG. We've been embedding ESG uh, factors into our business for many decades. Um, but in 2019, Yafit, you were named our chief sustainability officer, first for the company. And we're really excited about that because you actually just marched right down the road and got us all together and put together this sustainability website um, on our website, looking at all the risk factors and the opportunities that the company had. And so you put it all together for us. And in that process, walk us down that road. Um, did, you know, did the company change? what they were doing in any way uh, or the approach to ESG issues uh, when you were putting that sustainability website together? I think you hit the nail on the head, Joan. We have been integrating ESG into our business strategy for decades. ESG is not something that's you know, mine alone at Travelers, um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not running that by myself. That's something that is really integrated within the business um, across the different business units. And so when we embarked upon our sustainability reporting journey, there was this feeling at Travelers that we were doing so much with respect to ESG. We have such a compelling value creation story to tell um, and, and the way that it incorporates ESG factors, as we said, but we hadn't yet seized the opportunity to tell that story and to discuss those ESG initiatives publicly. So the project really did not change our approach to sustainability. And what I saw throughout that process in that first year especially was really how deeply ingrained ESG is in our company. It's just integrated uh, and embedded in the way that we execute day in and day out. And it's just part of how we create value. So that end product that you see today, which is a comprehensive sustainability report um, that creates that that conveys uh, how travelers creates value, uh, that discusses keeping the traveler's promise and how that's integrated within our value creation strategy, all of that is an articulation of what we've already been doing as a company. We just packaged it and articulated it so that all of our stakeholders could understand who we are and how we create value in the broadest sense. Okay, but but you think there's a lot of new organizations, and I say new, which have kind of grown up uh, around ESG. So there's the SASB. We have FASB. Everyone knows what FASB is. Now there's SASB, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And then there's the TCFD, the T Task Force on Climate Renewable financial disclosures. And so um, are you spending your days kind of writing SASB reports or TCFD disclosures? I mean, what does that look like? And, you know, how do you, how do you think about um, kind of checking the boxes and doing what all needs to be done uh, as investors are expecting companies to do these now? It is a massive endeavor, I would have to say. It takes us about nine months of the year uh, and over 150 subject matter experts internally to put together our reporting. 
Uh, that includes the comprehensive sustainability report we have on our website, as we discussed, plus our SASB report, plus our TCFB report. Those are all things that we update on an annual basis. Um, and so it, it really is a big lift. Um, but again, because we've already been doing all of this as a company, um, it, it, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's just about packaging it properly. Okay. Okay. Paul, we're going to get to you in, in, in one second on materiality because the uh, materiality question is really important. But Yafi, one more time back to you. How does a company or how should a company decide which ESG issues, there's so many of them, to prioritize? Because that is, I think, a really important factor when companies think about their ESG or their sustainability story. How do you prioritize those factors uh, in your mind? For sure. So I can give you my experience um, and what we did at Travelers when I first started in late 2017. We spent a few months literally doing nothing but engaging with our investors. And we went out to half of our investor base and shares outstanding at the time, representing about $11.9 trillion in assets under management to really understand their views with respect to sustainability disclosure. And one of the things that I sought to understand there was which ESG factors do investors believe to be most relevant to a property casualty insurance company? So I would say that our findings from those engagements, which took several months, uh, were really critical, particularly since our investors were the primary audience for our sustainability reporting. But in addition to speaking with our investors, we did conduct a formal prioritization exercise to help us focus on the specific topics that are relevant to our industry, our business, and our stakeholders. And the way that we did that was that we first identified a universe of ESG topics that could potentially be relevant to our industry um, by reviewing a whole host of internal documents, industry and peer reporting, analyses of the prominent ESG data providers, and the sustainability reporting frameworks. And then we prioritize those topics, uh, both through that detailed feedback that we got from our investors, as well as through a series of internal group discussions, each of which was dedicated to a specific uh, stakeholder group, whether it be our customers, our employees, our agents and brokers, travelers itself. And we did that because we wanted to make sure that we were taking our other stakeholders' views into account in addition uh, to those of our investors. And then ultimately, internally, we refined the list of priority topics to those 16 topics that you see on our website today that became the focus of our sustainability reporting. And that if you look at our sustainability site, we call our drivers of sustained value at Travelers. So, so that's a pretty involved process. Um, but I don't think that every company needs to go through that. I think there are less time consuming ways to identify the handful of ESG issues that are most relevant to the company's business strategy and are most linked to its economic sustainability. And Paul referenced this as well, but companies could look at which ESG oriented issues have been on the board's recent agendas or which ESG issues are already part of the company's business plan um, and which ESG related risks are already embedded within the company's enterprise risk management program. And of course, for public companies, many public companies are already conducting off-season engagements with their large institutional investors. So while they're speaking with their investors, it really doesn't take much to also get their thoughts on ESG issues um, that they think that, that a company in that industry should be reporting on. And finally, I'll just say companies can start small. They don't need to bite off as much as we did in our first year of reporting. I think it's important to start somewhere, um, again, with those ESG issues that they believe most relevant to their industry and business, and they could always build on that from there. I think that's really good advice, I actually do, um, in terms of smarting small. Um, so Paul, back to, back to you. There's, a, there's for lay people, okay? So we're not ESG experts, we're not lawyers, we're certainly not SEC lawyers on the phone here. What does materiality mean? How does that factor into the conversation? Uh, of ESG disclosures. So first, just what does materiality mean? Um, and, and how does that affect the ESG materiality disclosure? Well, so I guess uh, just basically like I was saying, materiality uh, as is understood in the whole legal, legal framework and you know, before the courts and 
uh, the SEC means, uh, you know, what is it that is important to a reasonable investor to make a decision regarding buying, selling, or holding a particular stock? And so that's uh, so. There's a lot in that to unpack, but but suffice it to say that it it doesn't matter if you are you know you 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 yourself focus on one particular issue. You you don't want to invest in any coal companies or gun companies or uh, you know what have it. Uh, so that's fine. That's up to you to do that. Um, but uh, you know, as far as you know, the reasonable investor who is looking to uh, you know invest for an economic return. Uh, you know, what is it that is important to, uh, to, that is a critical determinant in whether to, uh, you know, if you're trying to decide how to, uh, you know, dispose of your stock or whether to acquire it or whatever. So, um, and, but that that's, means that it's not a monolithic uh, type of a decision. It's a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. So, therefore, you know, what then arguably what should be mandated disclosure, um, you know, is a relatively small ambit, but like, Yafit was talking about travelers and other companies have a lot of voluntary stuff that they do. And in my uh, work with uh, companies as a consultant, you know, we help them. And I've talked to all sorts of investor groups and, and others who have, you know, particular wants or, or whatever that they would like to find out about uh, companies and encouraging them to do X, Y, and Z. But you have to really, you know, the, as the, Third good Marshall said, I mean, you can't disclose the world. And you, you mentioned SASB, um, which uh, they've now merged into, a, you know, with another group into a, a, a different organization. But I think they've kept that moniker Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. But, you know, they can't define sustainability. And what they're talking about is not accounting standards. It's maybe reporting and, and not in quite not quite that yet with the SEC. So I think there's a lot of definitional, you know, issues that go on. But if you look at what SASB does, for example, they have, if you, they have on their website, uh, this big matrix of 77 different uh, industries uh, on the horizontal axis. And then on the vertical one are 26 different attributes. You multiply that out and you get 2000 some odd uh, boxes there of what they have deemed as material for what particular industry or sub-industry and then, you know, what should be disclosed. So one of the things that they talk about disclosure there is the percentage of free range chicken eggs that uh, the company uses. Now, maybe that's important for some companies or not, but I, you know, I'm not sure that one could say a reasonable investor, um, you know, would use that as a, um, as a terminant to buy, sell, or hold. If you're a member of, uh, you know, some groups, then maybe that would be, but I think, you know, that's not necessarily um, for most people a, a determinant. So that's kind of the, the juxtaposition here between something that really is critical, uh, that's a material factor that a reasonable investor would, um, would view it that way, versus, you know, some voluntary disclosure that the company can do. And there are lots of companies who subscribe to SASB or TC FD or PRI or uh, GRI or whatever the ones that are out there. Um, and so that's fine. That's great. If they have investors who are very interested and knocking on their door constantly saying, you know, we'd really like to know that a lot of companies will say it privately. Some will disclose it uh, as well uh, in their um, in their disclosure. So, um, you know, so that's that's all fine. But when we talk about, you know, what should be mandated by the SEC, we have to remember that Disclosure isn't costless. You know, there is, that's why materiality is important. And, uh, you know, some people say, oh, it's only disclosure. I really can't argue against that. Why can't, you know, more the better. But we've seen how disclosure, like Thurgood Marshall says, can obfuscate important things because in the avalanche of information, uh, you know, even the most sophisticated investors can lose the, um, you know, the, the forest for the trees. So I think that's what we have to really remember. And, and I think that's a good point because uh, if you had mentioned, you know, her first job was really as, as looking at the whole ESG picture was to go out and talk to our investors, who holds our stock and what do they want us to do and see in this new sustainability website. So I think being an informed a company about what your investors are driving for is, is a critical point. But Paul, given I can't let you go without, I mean, talking about your SEC experience. So how quickly could the Biden administration or the new SEC chair move some of these new potential, I know they have a, this new regulatory flex agenda, 
but um, how quickly if they wanted to, and I know there's lots of internal discussions about this uh, at the commission, but uh, could they move this agenda quickly and have mandatory disclosure of all these different factors that they deem material? Or will this take you know, 10, 15 years to, to come about? Yeah, well, it won't take 10, 15 years and it won't take two months. Uh, I mean, they, they could, I guess, uh, push something through lickety split um, relatively lickety split, but um, it uh, that would then uh, make their rulemaking susceptible to, I think, a, a successful challenge uh, in court by uh, you know by people who will uh, you know inevitably um, you know, disagree with what they do. So I, from everything that uh, the new chairman is saying, Gary Gensler, he's in a speech last week, for example. Uh, you know, I think they will take a deliberative uh, sort of approach to this. Uh, come out with a proposal, which uh, then will take, still probably if they're crafting it, uh, you know, wh however long that'll take them, another couple of months or three months or something like that, uh, then propose it. And then uh, there'll be a comment period. The way our Administrative Procedure Act, it's the, the due process. Uh, a, a, an agency like this has to go out and tell people what it's thinking of uh, promulgating and then get their response. And then it, it has to respond to those responses uh, and then in its uh, final rulemaking. And then, um, and then of course, the rulemaking is subject to challenge. So if the SEC wants to do something really, you know, that, that's very broad and uh, very aggressive, uh, you know, I think they, uh, if they want to have it stick, they better, um, you know, dot all their I's and cross their T's. Uh, if it's a sloppily put together thing with little, uh, study and economic analysis as to the costs and benefits, then, you know, it will get shot down. Okay, I think you faded out there, Paul, but um, uh, so if you feel, let me go to you on this question. How are you thinking about the anticipated, you know, mandatory disclosure requirements versus voluntary, which companies like us do all the time? Sure, so from a traveler specific perspective, I'd start by saying, I think we're very well situated uh, to handle SEC mandated disclosures given our already comprehensive sustainability reporting. And we're not expecting uh, any disclosure requirements to result in significant changes in how we address ESG topics, given the fact that they're already integrated into our business strategy. But then zooming out um, on a more macro level, first of all, I agree with Paul wholeheartedly with respect to materiality. Um, I'd also say that having spearheaded the sustainability reporting process at Travelers for several, several years now and having that job of trying to make sense of all the noise out there on ESG, the concept of having a single blueprint to work from can seem enticing, but throughout these years, it's also become clear to me that there's really no one right way to produce sustainability reporting. And Coming back to the materiality point as well, um, you know, we, we appreciated having that flexibility to go out to our investors, to figure it out ourselves, to determine how our company's uh, value creation story should be told in a way that's most appropriate and effective for both our company and for our shareholders. And, and one of the things that concerns me is that given the unique characteristics of each company even within the same industry. It's just not possible or advisable to come up with a single uniform approach that would be right for all companies as it relates to ESG issues. So unless the SEC promulgates principles-based disclosure requirements rooted in materiality, um, which as Paul said, I don't think that's where the SEC is going with this. I think we'll end up, as Paul mentioned, with less meaningful disclosure for investors. I think SEC filings will be muddied with information that's not material. And I think public companies, again, to Paul's point, will have to spend significant resources collecting and disclosing that information. And, and anecdotally, um, given uh, my role on the Society uh, for Corporate Governance, I chair the Sustainability Practices Committee. I've been told by many companies that disclosures relating to climate alone uh, take dozens of employees and can cost millions of dollars. So I think ultimately we could end up with a situation that's not good for either investors or public companies and could ultimately harm the competitiveness of the U.S. capital markets over time. 
So, so Paul, let's go to uh, some audience questions. We have a number coming in. So here's a one for you, Paul. So um, these uh, disclosure requirements for public companies, which we talk about, could that change a uh, decision by a private company to do an IPO or to go public because they're so worried about the money they have to spend or being pushed in one direction or another by some groups who have an agenda. Do you think some companies are staying private longer uh, because of these potential new uh, disclosure requirements? There's no question that uh, public that companies, uh, you know, are uh, deferring or not going public. Uh, and I think it's mainly because of the costs of uh, that are entailed by uh, their uh, going public. So today we have half the number of companies than we did back, uh, you know, 20 years ago or so, uh, 25 years ago. And um, and just like other sorts of uh, groups out there, half the number of broker dealers and, and others. So it's and it's because uh, mainly because of the regulatory environment. Uh, and the costs that are entailed and the and the liabilities. So it's not just disclosure costs, but also uh, liability around, you know, the potential liability being sued and having class action lawsuits. And um, so I think that is uh, creating uh, this, uh, you know, there's a lot of private money out there that, uh, that uh, so people don't really need uh, to go to an IPO route. Uh, so here lately, SPACs have been, uh, you know, in the news as uh, a less costly way of uh, getting out into the public markets. So all those things um, have come together so that uh, uh, these days, you know, unfortunately, like uh, if you look back in, uh, like in the 1980s and, and early 90s, companies went to the public markets to get capital, to build factories, to try to get, develop their products and get them out there. Today, uh, if you look at uh, what's uh, what's going on, it's really a way for um, you know inside early investors, insiders to um, uh, to get liquidity uh, and then to sell the the company shares uh, to the public. So that that has been and that I think just goes all the way back to um, to regulation and uh, and how things have developed over the last few, uh, number of years. Okay, another question coming in. Um, this is from Miles Gibbons. So he asked, an activist hedge fund with 0.02% holding an Exxon uh, now has two board seats. So by all appearances, Exxon's ESG efforts were very comprehensive. Is the Exxon example too extreme for us to be concerned about? Or Paul, do you think this is a wave of the future that companies uh, have to be very concerned about? Oh, we'll see. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm eagerly waiting to see actually what the what the vote on that looked like, because uh, what I bet will be is that um, the individual investors who uh, voted in that uh, um, matter, um, you know, probably voted overwhelmingly for management. Exxon is an interesting company with uh, a very high percentage relatively of uh, individual investors versus institutions. And I think it was the institutions uh, that uh, that swayed things, and there are a lot of reasons for that uh, that maybe we'll have to go into some other time. But uh, but I, but I think it gets back to you know what the Yafit and and I were talking about earlier as to you know how these different groups are viewing things. I think uh, there that was one one hedge fund that was new that was kind of purpose built for this particular thing. And they bought the minimum number of shares to be able to put this thing forward and to run a short slate. Uh, you know, the short, it doesn't uh, take, they didn't have to uh, solicit every shareholder um, by running a short slate uh, under the rules. And so, you know, it was pretty low cost for them. I think they were claiming they paid $30 million. I'm not sure what they paid it for, but uh, anyway, they may be lawyers and other things. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, I think that was probably anomalous, but uh, we'll see how things go over, um, over the course of the next uh, few years. All right, thank you for that. Another one coming in your feet. We're gonna hit you with this one. So how do you see social inflation, right, in our business changing ESG considerations for the future? First of all, maybe explain what social inflation is just so everyone understands that. And then how do you uh, relate it back to ESG? Yes, of course. So social inflation, uh, again, not sure there's a universal definition, but it's essentially what we're seeing in terms of uh, nuclear verdict awards, um, the desire of juries to um, essentially stick it to to companies that are uh, that are in litigation. Um, and, and this what we're seeing is the uptick in uh, higher verdicts against companies in general. Um, I, I think 
in the end of the day, uh, sustainability or ESG really is about the long-term economic sustainability of sustainability of the company. And I think you could look at social inflation as one of those issues that needs to be managed. Um, I think it's another one of those risks that needs to be uh, mitigated appropriately. And so I, I see, I just sort of see it as part of one cohesive whole and one one issue that we really have our eye on here at Travelers. Okay. Um, and and if Joan, if Joan, if you don't mind, I did see a question coming in that I think is really critical to answer with respect to the business roundtable. Yes. Um, that was my next question, so you go oh, ahead. Okay, I just wanted to make sure yeah. we hit on that one uh, as we're coming up on time. Um, and so the question relates to the business roundtable statement on the purpose of a corporation um, and how that has uh, impacted or, or changed the way that we look at value creation. Um, and, and so just to level set everyone, the business roundtable statement um, really articulates this shared commitment to delivering value to customers, investing in, in employees, uh, dealing fairly and, and equitably with suppliers and supporting communities. Um, and, and it's interesting because it actually resulted in a media firestorm. It drew strong reactions from people on both sides of the aisle. Um, but the reason ultimately that our CEO signed that statement was really to acknowledge publicly what's, what successful companies have been doing all along, which is to act in a way that ensures long-term success for our shareholders. And, and to us, and this comes back to what I started the discussion with, this, is, this statement is really consistent with how we've managed our business for decades as responsible stewards of shareholder capital. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we've long recognized that we can't execute on our long-term financial strategy uh, without taking care of those stakeholders. So um, essentially, at least for travelers, I would say that the BRT statement really does not signify a change in how we manage our business. And and it's really, um, it's really uh, aligned with the way that successful companies have been uh, operating for decades. Okay, we're going to get another one in here for you, Paul. Thank you, Rafid. I'm glad you addressed that. I was, I was going to ask you that. This is from Aaron Tehan. So I have read uh, about the concept of double materiality. I think this means looking at both impacts on the company of climate change. So certainly in our business, we see the impacts of climate change uh, every day and the impacts by the company on climate change. So can you see the SEC going there in terms of double, double materiality? Well, I think, uh, I mean, that, that concept is mainly a European one. And so again, they don't really have the litigation environment that we have here. Um, they, they, you know, yeah. Lawsuits are very rare over there. Um, maybe they're on the uptick a bit, but their rules are pretty much, uh, you know, kind of stifle all of that. So, but here, you know, obviously materiality really means something. So um, I really kind of doubt that the SEC would adopt that concept because of just the whole weight of uh, court rulings and uh, you know, and and other uh, uh, the SEC its, its own rules. That would be kind of a major shift to do that. It's more of an informal type of concept. Uh, so again, I think uh, you know it, it. It ultimately comes down to if the SEC is going to pass a rule, they have to enforce it somehow. And if the the things are not material that they're demanding people to disclose then how do you bring a case against somebody? I mean, you could, maybe it's strict liability if, you know, it should be, you know, a particular number and you're off by more than a certain amount, um, even if it's not uh, traditionally conceived as a material type of uh, disclosure. So, you know, maybe they could go that way. Maybe the courts would buy it. Um, but I think there are a lot of problems with that. So I don't really see the SEC doing it. Could it be done informally, like whatever framework the SEC, um, you know, adopts, you know, if it adopts TCFD, as it seems like the chairman is, is talking about doing, maybe that kind of incorporates that concept somehow in it. Um, so maybe that kind of finds its way in the back door to our uh, jurisprudence here, but, um, you know, it would be kind of a, a difficult thing, I think, under the current environment or foreseeable environment to uh, to have it uh, go forward. 
All right. Well, listen, with that, we are out of time. And I just want to thank you, Paul. Uh, it was just terrific to, to host you today. And Yafit, of course, uh, keep doing what you're doing for the employees. We're so grateful you're here. And for customers and agents, uh, you represent us very, very well on this topic. So we really appreciate your thoughts.